Uh, well, GMT is AOE. It's uh, 0100 hours here at Urbanomic GMT. Hang on, wait. It's 0100 hours here. Urbanomic Studio HQ. Um, 1.8 clicks from Goon Gumpus in the heart of British summertime intensive temporal zone in the solar trance lockdown. The hard pants are off. The pizza is sliced. The protein packed peanut punch is flowing and we're back with another Plague Pod Live. Putting in some work to keep your ears full during the COVID season. And um, I've written off as a failed experiment, the last one. It definitely seems we haven't got anything else to talk about, so we're going to be talking about coronavirus again. So um, where are we? Uh, we're riding the curve. We're vibing with the virus. There's four stages, four phases of lockdown. Fear, disorientation, boredom, and then the fourth phase. Now, we just want to go out, touch each other's faces, and uh, we just want impending human extinction to become accessible as a dance floor, so we can go out again and uh, basically get freaky. I'm going to turn up now.
Right, so that first track seen off the ration lists, so we can get started. Let's talk about next week. Next week, I'm hoping to get on the show Mr. Thomas Moynihan, who at the moment is locked down during a global pandemic, putting the finishing touches to his next book for Arbonomic on existential risk. And no doubt we'll also be talking spinal catastrophism, M&Ms, chicken nuggets, ontography, recapitulationism, worms, Cornish time travel and Pepsi. But also next week, we're going to have an audience special. Last week, uh, sorry, last year. Last year now, right? Yeah, 2019. We published um, Unsound Undead, a book based around the audience hyperstitional mythos which looks at the ways in which the less explored fringes of the sonic intersect with the figures of the undead, the ghostly, the spectral, the revenant. It's an incredible collection. 64, yes, 64, 8 times 8 short essays. Authors including Jonathan Stern, Matt Fuller, Paul Purgus, Kristen Galano, uh, Eric Davis, Luciana Parisi, Eleni Ikionadu, Eugene Thacker, Steve Goodman, Toby Hayes, Aisha Hamid, Stephen Shiviro, and many more. You may know uh, we already did a kind of audio trailer for the book, which is on uh, Urbanomic SoundCloud. It's part of the uh, podcasts. Uh, so next week we're going to have some readings plus some exclusive stuff from from the audience crew. Allow me to say that all of this is being broadcast to you for free. Uh, you are invited to buy some books. We've also got a link up on the SoundCloud now where you, now where you can donate to Urbanomic. And I've also got a personal Ko-Fi or Ko.Fi or Coffee, whatever page. They really should have thought about that when they start the site. And thanks very much to those who've already bought me coffee. And thanks for everyone who's left comments on um, SoundCloud and YouTube. 
elsewhere. I appreciate it. Um, today, tonight, this morning, wherever you are, we're going to be talking about time, temporality, and templexity with some amazing guests. We're trying to span the time zone again. I think we've got all our guests waiting. We've got some um, accelero historian and global prognosticator extraordinaire Vince Garten. We've got Anna Greenspan, author of Shanghai Future. We've got Nick Land, author of Fang Numina and uh, Twitter Templexifier. We have Ben Woodard, the slimeologist and nature philosopher. We've got Amy Island, AI, xeno feminist, xeno poet, and uh, timeline scissorgizer. And we're going to ask whether this viral crisis is also a time crisis. Get deep into some COVID plex heterochronicity. So I'm going to get those guys online very soon. And uh, of course, as always, you're invited to call in and let me know how you're doing during the fourth phase. SMD track for that uh, Jets in her city and this is Swimful
Looper, a 2012 time travel film set in part in Shanghai, tells the story of hitmen who are hired to execute people sent back in time to the year 2044. Time travel hasn't been invented yet, says the main protagonist, Joe, at the start of the film, but 30 years from now, it will have been. In 2074, when a crime boss wants to end the contracts of his hired gunmen, who are known as loopers, he sends back their future selves to be killed by their younger incarnations. This is known as closing the loop. Once each loop has been closed, the hitman concerned receives a massive payout and the opportunity to live out the rest of his life in luxury. 30 years later, time folds in on itself and the assassination takes place from the other side. When Joe's loop closes, he flees with all his gold to Shanghai, despite the fact that he had been planning all along on France. The unexplained change of heart follows a switch in the production schedule that became embedded in the script. Looper director Brian Johnson had originally intended to set the film in Paris, but when Chinese distributors offered to pay to switch the film location to China, Johnson agreed to rewrite the script and transplant production from Paris to Shanghai. The resulting scenes contain spectacular images of Shanghai futurism, many of which were only shown to Chinese audiences. In addition, Looper was able to count as a co-production through a deal destined to be repeated, which allowed the film to bypass foreign quota regulations and premiere on the mainland. Johnson insists, however, that these pragmatic considerations did not negatively impact the film. In many ways, Shanghai was a more natural setting for a sci-fi movie than my beloved Paris, he admitted. In the cultural imagination, Shanghai and time travel are twinned. While Joe's life in Shanghai only begins once the circle is complete, Looper refuses the neatness of a closed time circuit. Much of the story is set in a parallel, alternative, or coinciding timeline in which the time loop stays open and the future remains receptive to change. In the past, Chinese modernity has generally been conceptualized as involving the adoption of a progressive, linear time that can replace the country's older and more traditional notion of cyclic temporality. From the reformers of the May 4th movement to the ideology embodied in the Cultural Revolution, the dominant idea has been that modern China must accept the forward chronology of Western time, erase the old to make way for the new. This conception of time as a unidirectional flow implies a relative notion of the future, essentially defined by its different from the present and the past. In linear time, the future is in front of us, waiting on the road up ahead, and even as the end of the road. When viewed in terms of such a timeline, Shanghai's contemporary modernity can only ever be a rerun the copy or repetition of conditions, actions, and attitudes of a modernity that already once has been. The modern as a historical epoch that culminated in the first half of the 20th century posited a future that could be projected, planned, predicted, and controlled. Postmodernism emerged from the wreckage precisely at the moment that this type of futurism collapsed. In China, however, where a developmental model based on centralized control seems to be supporting such staggering growth, the futurism of the past, that is elsewhere deemed retro, appears to be making a comeback. Look closer, however, and it is clear that China's remarkable rise is not, or at least not solely, based on the top-down planning of an authoritarian state. Rather, its yin-yang balance of shadow and light, the new modernity brewing in the contemporary Chinese metropolis pairs the bright spectacle of economic exuberance with a darker, bottom-up, unplanned, and unpredictable culture that emerges from the street. In this hybrid and multiplicitous modernity, the future, 
now intrinsically obscure, is no longer conceived as a destination or end point, or even clearly up ahead. Evolution from the informal to the formal, from the backward to the advance, which was never natural nor inevitable, is disrupted. In Shanghai's jumble of high-rises and street markets, industrial heritage and gothically slanted architecture, hidden lanes and suburban communities, the very processes of urbanization and development are being transformed. Shanghai evades a relative future by tangling the timeline. Its reimagination of the city of tomorrow is saturated by a nostalgia for what is to come. It is evident through the renovation of an Art Deco heritage that eludes historical comprehension, the reanimation of industrial zones that look back as they look forward, and the rejuvenation of an urban culture that aims to awaken an older golden age that Shanghai's ambition for the 21st century are suffused with echoes of the past. As a future city, Shanghai does not gradually arrive out of linear evolutionary history. It re-emerges in a temporal spiral out of which the future city reaches back to the past in order to construct itself today. Within this time spiral, Shanghai's neo-modernity offers an escape from the devastating dilemma that has plagued China's formulation of the modern. A spiral is neither trapped by the cyclical time of a stagnant tradition, nor committed to the forceful destruction of progressive linearity. Spirals are simultaneously progressive and cyclical, as the I Ching teaches. The spiral produces novelty while simultaneously returning again and again to the nascent sources. Contemporary Shanghai thus tends to the reinvention of an enormously rich cultural and philosophical heritage. The path was a circle, says Joe at the end of Looper, so I changed it. You're listening to Urbanomic Plague Pod Live. It was a reading from Anna Greenspan's book, Shanghai Futures, from 2014, published by um, an obscure publishing house called uh, Oxford something or other. We're going to be talking to Anna in a moment, along with Vince, Amy, Ben and Nick. Thanks very much for the coffees. Coffees are rolling in tonight. Nice one.
This one's going out to the neighbours. Special Easter treat. Very happy to welcome onto the Plague Pod tonight. We have uh, Vince Garton, who was with us once before. He's in London. He is a political analyst, interested in uh, particularly in East Asia, the intersection of politics with economics, technology, and aesthetics. We have Ben Woodard, who's a postdoc researcher at uh, Leuphana University in Lüneburg and the author of Schelling's Naturalism, um, Edinburgh University Press, and Slime Dynamics, Generation, Mutation, and the Creep of Life. Um, we have Anna Greenspan, who teaches at NYU in Shanghai, and is the author of Shanghai Future, Modernity Remade. And we have uh, Nick Land, who is Nick Land, who is the author of Fang Numina, published by Urbanomic, of course, and Sequence Press. And we have Amy Island, who is the keeper of the circuits. So, yeah, I thought one thing that keeps on coming up throughout the podcast we've done so far is the question of time and what this whole um, event is doing to time. And there's clear, it seems clear that there's some kind of weird temporality at work here. Um, are you all with me? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Right. Oh, chorus. Um, so it seems like there's this kind of paradoxical heterochronic event that we're all living simultaneously but at different times um, and Ben has written in um, there's a there's a great collection of articles over at the Identities Journal um, one of which is by Ben called The Curve of the Clock where he calls it a temporally and spatially distributed event um, and as he points out and maybe we could compare it with a, um, in astronomy the image that we're receiving of the changing shape of the pandemic within which we're all trying to kind of orient our everyday lives, those numbers are already coming late. There's already a lag. Um, so we don't really know what's happened when, and we have no real clue when or how it's going to end. So first of all, I mean, we began the podcast with asking people to call in and tell us about how they were feeling, um, how the whole thing was affecting them. So to start with, you have these psychological effects, right, that we're in a kind of uh, calendrical freefall. It's this weird type of holiday. Um, and I've been reading today uh, Francois Bonnet's uh, new book, After Death, which is coming out later this year with, with Urbanomic. Uh, and there's a note there where he talks about how calendar is etymologically connected to calling. So it's to do with convocation. It's to do with moments during the year where the collective, there's a collective calling together and a synchronization. Uh, and what's extraordinary right now is that the calendar is suspended but there's, at the same time, there's this one event that we're all synchronised to. So from a psychological point of view, uh, several of the accounts I've read of the kind of lockdown or quarantine, uh, in particular Preciado's um, short article, have made it sound like this generates a kind of vertical time, that the existential pressure exerted by this event and the way that it's concentrating um, everyone's domestic circumstances means that it becomes this kind of reckoning um, it becomes a, a moment of uh, a bit like the eternal return where you say do I really want to do this forever because that's what it feels like um, and maybe more positively there's also this discovery of a kind of dilation or detensing of time 
a kind of spreading out of days that have been released from deadlines and meetings and um, even shopping trips, I guess. Uh, but that's also then connected to the question of what comes after. Like, are we going to ever re-inhabit the calendar again? How are we going to feel about that? Um, are we going to be able to re-synchronize? Um, and then on a, a wider level, uh, if it's not a singularity, it's certainly a global synchronization. It's a truly global event. Um, and I find myself continually doing what I'm calling a transcendental double take that I think I'm actually living through this thing that everyone else on the globe is living through at the same time. And that's a kind of a strange thing. Uh, politically and economically, things that for a single country would be economically ruinous, since they're happening to every country on the globe, seem to take on a different um, light. Uh, but then, of course, it's not exactly synchronous because we're all at different places on the curve. Uh, and one of the graphics that I've been looking at is the one from the FT, where instead of having the um, x-axis showing you time, it's actually um, plotted all of the countries from the start of their curve. And that gives you a really good indication because, of course, you can see the Wuhan curve has already landed and you can see the rest of us right up in the air. So that gives you this kind of freeze fa frame of the, the way we're in this kind of limbo, waiting to um, cross the curve and arrive to where, to where Wuhan has already got to. Uh, and then finally, I guess there was a, I would say there's the, the question of acceleration, that in one sense this seems like a stalling of the global machine, but on, an, on the other hand, as we were talking about um, a couple of podcasts ago, it's also accelerating all kinds of tendencies. So it's accelerating remote working, dependency on the internet, and hikiki morization, if I can say that. I tried saying that last time and it didn't really work. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's accelerating the tendency toward a kind of um, digitally enabled atomization of, of society. So I think there's all kinds of different angles from which this thing is, uh, is um, shaping, reshaping time. Um, so maybe um, Anna, if we could, if I could ask you to say something. I don't know whether there's anything that you could say that links this um, this sense of time linked to the viral crisis with the sense of time that you talk about in your book, uh, spe which is specifically related to Shanghai and, and modernity. But um, I don't know how are you how are you feeling about um, what's happening templexically at the moment. Um, well, I think a lot of what you just said is the things that are on my list. So the the time lag that displaces the present um, and, and the stopping of time um, and this strange, as you said, synchronicity that's uh, at the one hand synchronicity, but at the same time, um, everyone else at different spots in time. Um, I guess my, my time obsession at the moment is with waves. And right. so it's interesting. Yeah. That, um, them, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, the, the image of the, the curve is, is a wave diagram or yeah. you can certainly read it like that. So, um, you know, what it is to, what it is to flatten the curve is, is really to make a longer wave. Um, so maybe there's that. Sure. So it's um, it's like a, a frequency question. Yeah. So the so the you know like if you do nothing, it's a higher and steeper wave. And if you know all the rhetoric that we're getting, um, but flattening the curve, the curve is a is a time diagram, right? As you said. Of course. Yeah. 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 Is the same as flat curve. What was that? Um, increase the wavelength is a, is a synonym, really, isn't it, for a flattened curve? Yeah, right. Ben, are you there? No. Is Ben here? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, you were talking about in your um, piece about um, this idea of a kind of um, what did you call it? 
You, you, if I can't remember, you must be able to remember. You wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you mean the face horror thing? Or... Yeah, right, face horror. Can you can you explain that a bit? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, it's just it's just an inversion of an idea from um, Darcy Thompson, who you know kind of explains how uh, you know the shape of things or the shape of the heterogeneity of something um, makes it seem beautiful if it's all made of the same stuff. Um, so, like waves, like he talks about waves, waves in a field or in an ocean, you know, he says it's beautiful when we can see that there's a spatio-temporal disparity between them. Right? So it's not just that there's a big and small, but that the bigness and the smallness have are a function of time. Um, and so I was thinking, um, you know, looking at the statistics, and I'm sure other people uh, just, you know, looking at the numbers all the time and looking at the graphs, um, it's... You know, the the only sort of uh, snapshot experience you can have of the whole pandemic is to kind of picture it as this basically kind of inverted, you know, phase um, beauty and this, instead of this phase horror where you kind of just see, you know, the crests of the waves across the planet in terms of the dead. Um, and to me, that seemed like the only way to actually picture it as a whole, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, we're all kind of trying to, I guess, produce some kind of image for ourselves that will allow us to grasp this and, and failing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is I'm like... green. So... <laughs> That's fine. Um, so, Nick, do you want to say something about this kind of wider question of um, synchronization? Because there's a kind of global synchronization, but it's certainly not in any kind of triumphant sense of unification. And it also feels like uh, uh, the pressure of the event is also accelerating possibly fragmentary trends that you've been tracking for a long time. What's it doing to the globe? Um, well, I wonder, Robin, if, if it would be possible to just kick that question a little bit up the road of this, of this chat, because I think we're yeah. going to definitely get onto this whole thing, like globalization, and deglobalization, um, you know, uh, 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 lots of stuff in Vince's recent piece is obviously very relevant to this as well, I think. Um, but... I wondered whether I could just read out a strange little text that was um, put up on Tyler Cullen's Marginal Revolution blog, uh, sort of yeah. latest in March. It's, he, and he's in turn quoting a guy called Scott Ellison um, and his idea for how to deal with the, the virus. It was obviously, we're talking mid-March at this point, so people could see what was happening to some degree. And he says... Quote, I propose temporarily stopping time. Yeah. I mean, I know temporarily <laughs> stopping time is such a great description <laughs> in itself. Yeah. Then he carries on. This means that today's date, Tuesday, March 17th, 2020, will remain the current date until further notice. This also means that everything that happens in time e.g. mortgage due dates, payrolls, travel booking, stock market trading, contract gigs, concert sporting events, will be paused. Yeah, right. Yeah. It also means that all of these events remain on the books and will continue as planned once time is resumed. Yeah. Um, so part of, I guess... It sounds like it kind of what's happening already, but properly yeah. implemented. It seems like we've got a very um, ineffective and incomplete version of that going on. Yeah, I was exactly going to say that it's it's like this is the formalization of the kind of um, feeling and this absolute sort of monotonous, changeless state of duration that's involved in it. And, you know, on one hand, obviously Scott Ellison is saying, you know, the way to fight the virus is to put the whole of society into suspended animation. Um, 
And it's quite interesting that just very shortly before uh, this all kicked off, maybe it was at the, in the early stage of kicking off, actually, I, I forget, there was the sort of story that was very viral on social media about Jordan Peterson uh, because of his various problems had gone to Russia on his daughter's <laughs> abide and agreed to be put into an induced coma. Yeah. And there was a lot of kind of interest in this whole what the hell induced coma thing. But obviously he's in a way being quite prophetic. <laughs> this, this, this induced coma is the giant policy story of our time. Oh, yeah. You know, how do you put everything into an induced coma? Um, and then later worry about pulling pulling it out. So anyway, yes, that's uh, that's my first contribution I had. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right that um, basically all we're seeing is a slow, piecemeal, uh, badly managed version of stopping time. Does this like uh, does this bring you back to some of the work? I mean, I know. I should say this, I was, we were saying this um, when we just briefly met up before. Um, I know, you know reunions always make for good entertainment, but this is like the first time we've actually had a conversation f um, through a vocal medium rather than text for two decades at, at least. Um, I was just going to ask, does this kind of bring you back to any of the stuff you were working on last time we were speaking about um, calendars? <laughs> because calendars Cal were a big thing at one point. Oh, uh, yes. But not formally, not formally. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that those links are all super interesting. I mean, I found your remarks about calendars very interesting at the start. I mean, I think that one thing about calendars that's worth noting is that obviously the disease hit like exactly at Chinese New Year, uh, uh -huh. at the dawn of the year of the metal rat. Uh, and it And it disrupted, of course, that celebration and now as it rolls through the world it 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 disrupts these like easter and and passover and all these other uh ritualized calendric celebrations right yeah i mean it feels weird that i mean it's not like i pay a lot of attention to easter but it feels strange that anything calendrical should be happening during this period which i guess just reinforces what we're already saying that um we're on a kind of badly managed um half half baked time stop yeah time out vince do you want to come in on this um i love the idea of stopping time i i think it's interesting to look at the history of this um Linear time as, as such is, is historically inherently bound up with catastrophe, I think. And if you cast your eyes back into the mists of ancient history, when the first political experiment with linear time was something called the Seleucid era. Um, and this, I mean, linear time is not an obvious, it's not an obvious concept that you should count your years going forward in the continuous linear um, sequence. The first time that was tried on a mass scale was after Alexander's conquest in Babylon. And that was pretty much as close to a world political catastrophe as you could imagine at that time, the sort of everything changing at one go. And so this, the advent of this political overturning, I guess you could also call it an, 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 an anastrophe, right? There's a cascade upwards of political systems coalescing that then inaugurated the first linear era, which, uh, actually lasted for a long time. It's a dating system called uh, the, the Year of the Greeks. And in some places of the world, it was used up until the 20th century. So linear time is bound up with catastrophe. This is a different sort of catastrophe. Obviously, it's not a political catastrophe in the sense that Alexander's conquests were. Um, it's a completely anti-political catastrophe. It's something which is uh, demobilizing politics, disrupting politics. And that then inaugurates a new kind of time. Yeah, what kind of time is it? <laughs> this is what we need to know. I don't know. I mean, that's... A... <laughs> I was just thinking, like, so if we got used to the fact that every few years this kind of thing was going to happen, then uh, would we have an, some kind of new type of calendar? Like, the, it would be kind of like a potlatch event that every so often 
we just accept that this was going to happen, everything's going to stop, the economy is going to be fucked, and then we're going to start again. Because it's not unlikely that this might this would happen again soon. I mean, is, is there now a new kind of cyclicity indexed by pandemics? Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's obviously... Pandemonium. So it, it's Pandemonium. a virtue to, to, of it to say, uh, you know, this could happen again. That that it's it it's sort of inherently paradoxical as well, isn't it? To say that I mean, you know, a huge part of what this is is precisely that it, even though there's a distant history of plagues or the, a century ago, obviously, or the reference is almost to the to the Spanish flu. It, it's yeah. it's precisely that it's so completely uh, unanticipated that it took everyone completely by surprise and it was completely off everyone's radar, that is the phenomenon. You know so, what I um, heard the other day, which was interesting, was that, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Wimbledon, the tennis, the company who runs Wimbledon had taken out pandemic insurance. So they've yes. been paying millions and millions for years for pandemic <laughs> insurance. And now they're finally getting a massive payout. So I was thinking, you know, on that basis, what kind of impact is this going to have on the global system of risk management insurance? That I mean, that would surely be absolutely gigantic. Definitely. I mean, I think it makes you realise how much people have been in a mindset of thinking that everything important that's happening is basically endogenous. You know, and you just have to understand, you have to theorise the system, however it whatever you, you think it is, and then you're basically um, telling a story about this set of predictable endogenous effects. And the sheer exogenous nature of, of this thing, I think, has really blown everyone away and, 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 and often actually kind of silenced people or just stopped them in their tracks. That it, it's just ruinous of all the narratives that everyone has been involved in for for years because of the fact that it's not based on some kind of endogenous process at all. It's yeah. that you can play your game, it can all be going well or badly, depending, and then something just comes from outside and kicks the whole thing. Yeah, it's it. an asteroid, basically. Basically, yeah. But it's, it's interesting that pe people like uh, Nassim Taleb in particular has been very vocal that the pandemic is not a black swan. It's not something that was completely unanticipated. The fact is that people just failed to prepare for it in an adequate way. Um, so it, it's it's an exogenous shock that that should people should have seen coming. Um, there wasn't coming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no one else. <laughs> but I think that, it's kind of interesting yeah. why it is or how it is that people didn't see it coming, right? Um, because sort of even while it was happening, people didn't see it coming. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even myself, I mean, I sort of saw it and didn't see it. So there is a way in which it's the kind of event, I mean, some people talk about it this because of its exponential nature. I don't know if that's the reason that it is, um, you know, somehow there's a failure of prediction um, even though obviously everyone should have known that it was coming. I mean, everyone knew there were 5 million people or whatever it was that left Wuhan before the close down happened. So everyone should have known, but somehow. But then what would it even mean to know that something yeah. like this is going to happen? That would be the question I would ask, you know, what epistemologically speaking in terms of, you know, uh, how, how would you prepare for something like this? How would you, you know, what, what kind of knowledge would that be, really? Because, you know, unless everyone knows it and everyone's prepared for it, it's not going to do you much good, is it? This this is like what, like, I think actually refutes the uh, idea that Vince just brought up about the Black Swan event. Like, it really is something that is shredding epistemology and our ability to model predictively. Um, and even when we do have some kind of modeling, it's impossible to implement it in any effective way. And the most striking thing temporarily about the virus is that it's put us all into a reactive, like a globally, it's put humanity into a reactive position. Or maybe a better way to phrase that is that it's shown us the nature of the reactive position that we were always in from the beginning in really stark terms, because we just can't keep up. Um, it's actually and like, more like what Ellie Ayash calls the, the blank swung, right? Which is like, you can make 
all of your bets in the casino, but what if the casino burns down? It's this complete change of context. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Right. It's like absolutely changing the rules of the game. Um, but it's like, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because in order to counter it in any way that's vaguely effective, we have to become we have to become more like the virus. We have to become inhuman in in the way that we need to evacuate from uh, our behavior, this kind of fundamental human sociality. We have to take out this really human aspect of the way that we uh, relate to each other. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of playing out this dynamic that you get in serial killer movies where the detective has to become more and more like the killer in order to be able to catch them. The detective has to learn how to think like the killer so that they can preempt the next move. Um, so we have to think like the coronavirus uh, in order to see how it's going to unfold before it does and to preempt the transmission patterns. But unlike the detective in a lot of films, we're really crap at it. And we're, we're seeing this really like darkly laid out in front of us. Um, are we that bad at it? Or is it just that uh, there's a kind of <laughs> a massive cognitive dissonance at work that people simply can't, they don't, people seem to, simply don't seem to be able to alter their behaviour accordingly. I mean, we have a fairly good idea of how viruses spread. Even a child has quite a good idea of how uh, illness spreads from one person to another. It's not that complicated, is it? But um, it's more to do with uh, actually... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's again, it's a kind of epistemological matter. It's like, how do you get get it through people's heads? Well, one of the things is it's... In the UK, at least. It's like forced us into this global assemblage. Like the subjectivity that we have to operate with now yeah, is yeah. global or at least national. Um, and it's impossible to coordinate that many different nodes into something that has an effective response to this. And I think that just shows us something fundamental about humans from the beginning that we're kind of uncoordinatable in this way. We're really bad at it. We're just like the really crap detective that ends up getting killed by the serial killer in the end. I think the point about having to de to dehumanize to face the virus is, is a good one. And I'm re reminded of the fact that when China imposed the initial mass quarantine measures, which have now become normal, basically, in many parts of the world, um, the reaction was kind of disbelief that this is this is not something that can be done in the modern era. I remember reading a long article saying that China doing it uh, can only mean that uh, they've already completely lost control and uh, there's no chance that it could possibly succeed. Um, but over time, especially after Italy did it and then after more and more Western countries did it, this way of operating, which according to conventional political theory would be a completely inhuman way for a state to act, has become normal. Right, right um, and it kind of connects to this sort of idea that. Oh, sorry, Ben. Oh, you should, no, you can no, go ahead. No, 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 you go. Oh well, I was just gonna say like the other thing is a bit maybe more boring, but in terms of it, there's a lot to do with the models of epidemiology, and I think we're in a situation where it's taken a long time to actually take causality seriously in epidemiology because for so long it was just based on statistics where there was a kind of agnosticism about like human decision in, in, involved in it. And then once you get to like the 1960s and 1970s, when you start to have causal inference being used in epidemiology, there's kind of a sense that, well, okay, like there's some human choice that needs to be made in terms of preparedness and things like that. But by the time we sort of grasped this, it was sort of handed over to automated systems. So I think on the one hand, we sort of know that statistical models require obviously some added action, but we've gotten used to the fact that the action that needs to be added to the statistical models is supposed to be like computationally taken care of for us. And so I think this has put us in a weird position where we feel like we have things under control, but we don't. <laughs> There's an interesting his, historical comparison as well in terms, in terms of the epistemological side here, because when the plague was going around Europe in the 17th century, so not the Black Death, but like the early modern period, there it, it, the debate over how to actually respond to it went hand in hand with this giant scientific debate over whether diseases are spread by miasma or by contagion. 
Yeah. Which that still so doesn't doesn't seem to be clear to some people in uh, high positions in the government in the UK. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wonder if there is any kind of formal formally similar debate going on at the moment. In what sense? Well, for example, in the UK, there is this big debate between the so-called the imperial model and the Oxford model, right? <laughs> if you've seen these news yeah. stories, the imperial model is saying that the, the virus will probably overload the health healthcare system and then hundreds of thousands might die. And then the Oxford model, so-called, which claims that two thirds of the population or whatever have already been infected and the, the virus is just the flu um, in, terms of its, in terms of its mortality. And clearly those both correspond to completely different ways of handling the virus in a similar way to the way that miasmatic and, and contagion theories did in the 17th century. So whether there is then this kind of epistemological debate about what exactly is going on in natural science um, and how that plays into, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not well informed enough about uh, what's going on there. No. But it certainly seems like there's no uh, consensus. I think there's one actually very simple epistemological issue that's tied up with, with the issues people have been saying, which is the fact that, um, you know, if you look at the cybernetics of panic with this, with this whole system, it's got many aspects, but the one that's disease related, the, the basic, uh, it's, it's self-limiting or self-suppressing in the sense that if people drastically change their behavior, in fact, at, at a level that was completely unimaginable before, I mean, an apocalyptic level of a reaction, then you do actually squash it, and which means it doesn't really happen. I mean, so, so it was politically impossible for anyone to do the sort of things that we've now seen done until there was graphic evidence about quite how disastrous it could potentially be. You know, in, in advance of that vivid sense of this could be a complete disaster. So I think for the West, actually, even Italy had to happen to get to the state where we are. Because if people had done yeah. Italian type things soon enough to stop Italy happening, everyone would have thought it was completely insane, completely disproportional, um, and therefore completely politically unimaginable. Um, so this obviously relates partly, for instance, to the, the agency stuff Ben was talking about. Like, it's, you can't actually do these things until you've managed to really have a, um, a lurid disaster on, on a scale that is sufficient to just overwhelm people's sense of what would be considered proportional uh, response. This, and this connects to the point that Thomas Moynihan made, which I mentioned in my, in my last blog post where he says that catastrophe is actually a kind of impulse to thinking. It's also an impulse to actually doing something. You can only do something once the catastrophe has, or has already arrived in a sense, and it, it actually enables thought in that sense. Right, so we're all if we're all stuck in this reactive relationship to um, to the catastrophe. Like, is there a way to wriggle out of that? Is there a way to respond in a non-reactive way to the pandemic, or to kind of keep up with its time, to live in time, rather than against the the time of the virus? Is there a way to do that, or are we now kind of consigned to just reacting against um, what we've already seen as the the kind of image of the disaster? I think we can, we're living in a kind of interference pattern between two different uh, wave systems. We're living in this strange kind of scrambled uh, noise between our, um, you know, calendrical everyday life and this totally different wave that's just kind of swept over us and, yeah, it's come from outside. And, and there are also... We're trying to negotiate some kind of, yeah. um, some kind of way between them, right? Mm. And, and there are also these two uh, different wave functions almost of the virus itself and the political response. And there was a, uh, a widely circulated piece which had the great title, The Hammer and the Dance, where the hammer is the initial 
quarantine to try to crush the virus and then you have to have this protracted so-called dance where you impose measures repeatedly to prevent future outbreaks up until you can stamp it out completely by a vaccine or whatever so i guess it's a, it's a, it's almost like a helical structure between the the, polit the political response and the virus where they're both responding to each other <laughs> yeah i mean it's sort of weird like is it reactive because uh, the whole flattening the curve thing is that you presume a future, well, there's these different models of the future, and that you then intervene into those in order to uh, postpone the future, and then, and then I guess, sort of wait for this other intervention that will change the future. Um, so, I, yeah, the time dynamic just in sitting at home doing nothing is obviously complex yeah and it's it, i don't think it's purely um about reacting to the virus because i think the way the virus moves is itself of course a reaction to political measures and and behave this is sort of predictable so when you lift the lockdown if you do it too early then it's going to spread um it'll probably spread at some point anyway and then you'll have to impose the lockdown again so it's it's it, it's a two-way street I mean, I definitely have a question about predictive modeling. Like, you know, I think in the pre-COVID era, uh, m most analysis of sort of techno capital was that it was all about predictive modeling. And and I think, as we were saying, yes. there's now a lot of doubt about that. And so it will be interesting to see what happens to predictive modeling, um, you know. I mean, the initial Chinese response doesn't seem to have been based on political on uh, predictive modeling so much as just prudence. Um, they took a leap in the dark because they had no real statistics by which they could have predicted how exactly the virus was going to behave in response to their measures. And I think a lot of these political responses um, probably have to depend a lot less than they look on actual forecasting because the models are all over the place. There was a great quote from an Italian epidemiologist a while back who said something like the models really only work about one or two days in advance. They're worse than the weather forecasts. So well, then in the end, all we have is this very common sense kind of image of the curve. So it is really a case uh, of just generating some kind of... Um, graspable image rather than actually having some clue about what's going on yeah i think well, that's, uh, that sounds good let's um this, take a break this, and then we'll come back and uh, pull this back to the whole time question again yeah
another track of Code Nines unreleased dubs before that uh, Prop Fiscal and before that Shook Knight who's also just put out um, an album of unreleased dubs on Bandcamp which is well worth a listen play some more of that later Take a vote before we let Rezo call in. Okay. Are you still there, everyone? Yeah. 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 Sorry, I cut you off, I think, Nick. What were you mm-hmm. about to say, if you can still remember? Um, I know, I was just at the curve. I mean, it's an amazing term, the way it suddenly started being used, like the curve. Everyone now its reality is now acknowledged by everyone but but you know what what is the curve it's 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 actually complicated in a way because it's not it's not just what happens but it's at least in part um this mass 
education in exponential functions that everyone is 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 being compelled to undergo and there's a kind of pure uninhibited exponential function kind of lurking behind actual outlets um with everyone being guided by the fact that if you don't do it right you get you get onto the curve you know the curve is really as it's kind of you know the disaster that could happen You mean it's like a, a looming virtuality, basically? Yes, I think so. I mean, it's the thing about I, what triggered this one was you saying everyone has to learn how to, you know how to think about this or to imagine it or to give it a shape. And and in a sense, the shape that we have and that is training everyone's intuition, the pure shape of the exponential function is I think always at work and isn't something that you just modify or adapt or you know depart from in the direction of what is empirically real about the epidemic. It's something that you don't leave behind because it's always it's always part of what you're seeing as some kind of imminent potentiality of, of the epidemic, the contagion. I think the, the curve is also, in a sense, it's 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 kind of liquid disaster in itself. Flattening the curve is channeling disaster and trying to keep it within a particular hydraulic limit. Yeah. On the on the curve graphs, you always have this this horizontal line, or sometimes it, it bends slightly upwards. That represents healthcare capacity, and when yeah. that is breached, then all hell breaks loose. That's the idea. Um, so we're trying to keep it within the the channel. Yes, that's right. And does this have any um, bearing on the question of time then? Time? Yeah. Just in the sense that, um, I don't know, like, uh, it seems to, we seem to then be looking at this kind of space-time block where this uh, this huge thing is just kind of lurking there. And we have to navigate around it somehow. I mean, I think this thing that you started with um, maybe is worth trying to pick apart and spend some time with, which is this um, dislocation of the present, right? Because the present is being, you know, because we're somewhere on the curve and we know that there's a time lag about where we are on the curve in the present. Mm. But also because we know like there's no or, that you know, no other events are going to happen before we get to the end of the curve, right? Yeah. Everything else right. is suspended. Yeah. Until then. yeah. So there's a kind of, this is the, the strange aspect of the present where uh, there's kind of a... Um, I don't know, like a time lag in both directions, both towards in the past and 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 to the future. And so, um, I think that's the the dislocation of it is got to do with how it changes the nature of the present in some way. Yeah. Another another temporal aspect that I I I just wanted to bring up though was this this literal feeling of time travel, which I keep coming back to something that uh, Dino Jang said, um, watching stuff happen in the West is like, I mean, it's about as close as you can get to actual time travel watching the West from China at the moment. Yes, like Cuomo's famous words when he said, look at us today, we are your future. So that's that's very similar. It's, it's, it's that it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it also, of course, it's the old um, Gibsonian thing that the future's already yeah. here, it's just unevenly distributed. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I think it also this all needs looping back to where we started about stopping time. Like this question about how does, how does this exponential function relate to time? Well, in a way, you know, what are you trying to stop when you stop time? You're, you're in a way you're in a way doing a portrait of time in the very social process of trying to arrest it. 
and that and that and that portrait it seems to me is the portrait of this e exploding exponential function that's the thing that you're trying to that's what you're trying to stop you know um, so you know, is it a portrait How, what do you mean well it's like you say if you say uh, okay we're going to stop time well, what does that mean you know it you in in filling that in and saying this is what it is to stop time, uh, you're 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 drawing a, a, a picture of time, and that picture of time is is a picture of the uninhibited explosion of the virus. Right. So in fact, we're in the pre basically we're in the presence of far too much time, more time yes. than we can cope with. Uh, epistemologically and as a species and and this is part of this whole thing about you're only seeing the the time lag factor like people have compared it to this thing about light from a distant star it's that you know everyone's in this in this thing where to put it into the terms that you have we've got far too much time but there's there's far more time even than we're seeing there's a massive huge a uh, submerged iceberg of, of exploding time uh, that we can indirectly intuit by this lag statistic and that we, we're trying to uh, flee from into suspended animation. The time bug. <laughs> bug. As in the millennium bug. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also wondering about something like um, it's related. I think something Vince said, um, you know, because there's a way. I think like everyone else, I'm reading all the plague books, like the Camus and the uh, plagues and people, and um, you know, there's this sense in which contagion, pure contagion, or, or or plagues haunt all of history, right? That as this kind of virtual. Um, virtual mode or whatever and and so um i think it's somehow related that there's like we we understand even though this is you know we couldn't see it coming we don't there's something is that understand this mode of just pure contagion or uh, exponential contagion and so this is also i think related to this time travel thing about what happened in china now happens in Italy, and that happens in New York, is that, well, I, I'm interested in what people think about this, that that there is just this mode of being, which is plague mode, and and it just gets triggered, and that's what we're in, and, and that has kind of haunted all of history. Right, and you think that's invariant across, across historical time, that it's just like the kind of hibernation that you go into? Yeah, like, you know, it's interesting. Well, I'm curious about it. But you know, these modes of quarantining and things that, as we said, seemed would have seemed completely impossible, is just, that's what everyone does. Yeah. Well, um, maybe you know? um, also an interesting way to look at it is in terms of war, because, I mean, obviously, in the UK, every, everyone's um, point of comparison for everything forever is the blitz and there's right. i definitely think there's some kind of um more joy in the, being able to um go back into this wartime mentality and as i, I think i said before it's pe even people who obviously never experienced that there's some kind of genetic memory in british people that you know if we can get locked into our houses and eat shit food and not be able to do anything there's a kind of jouissance involved in that but um you know there's many other senses in which you could say you know, uh, it's also an opportunity to put the economy on a war footing. There's all kind of interest, uh, all kinds of interesting comparisons that could be made um, between that as as another kind of catastrophic mode of being that suddenly a whole nations can be tipped into. Yeah, shelter in place is a good expression in this, isn't it? Like for Brits, it has to be good because it's got shelter in there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, I'm meant to be the one who's tired. It's like 2 a.m. here. Drink some coffee, people. <laughs> <laughs>
Right, you're listening to the Urbanomic Plague Pod Live.
These days I might be paranoid, but I stress it as I train it. And if I keep my cool when it's heating, not when it gets hot, it ain't the climate. I'm a wild boy from a mud house and I call it Arkham Asylum. I'll peep your game, but I don't play. I am the way from Poseidon. I know a couple bitches only want to be around me when they see me shining. I know a couple people only talking to me now because they hear I'm thriving. I know they want to get ahead of me up in this game, but they ain't surviving. I'm built for this, I feel my split, I smoke my life. Let them try to get out of that shot. Maybe slap out the with some leg shot. Me mean, head shot, no leg shot. Any boy this me, them dead on the spot. We don't take talk, we don't take shots. From any sound boy, pan any block. Any boy violate me, cause when I get shot. We don't give a fuck, them dead on the spot. None of them try to get out of that shot. Maybe slap out the back with some leg shot. Me mean, head shot, no leg shot. Any boy this me, them dead on the spot. We don't take talk, we don't take shots. From any sound boy, pan any block. Any boy violate me, cause when I get shot. We don't give a fuck, them dead on the spot. What? This is playing at completely wrong speed, temporarily deranged. One before that, uh, that's another of Shook Knight's unreleased dubs on, uh, just released on Bandcamp, that's called Headshot. We had Reza as well, but I think he's gone to sleep. How are we doing, guys? Uh, good. 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 Yeah. I'm eating Insta eggs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's the season of Humpter to Doom, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not enough worm, to be honest. Can so, I, can I? Yeah, go on. Time thing, you know, are you guys, have we got enough on the table already? No, go like, on. No, it's rest some more in. Well, well, because one of the things that I think is like also affecting maybe more subtly this just common time intuitions is this weird sense that's very close, at least to some sense of like inverted time signature of a whole bunch of things that were happening that have been so dramatically recontextualized in this way that's very smooth, you know. So you almost do get this teleological sense of, oh, that's what that was about. And I'm thinking, you know, for instance, the huge AI surveillance matrix discussions that were going on just before, everyone sort of obviously 
inclined to the libertarian side on that one. Um, and now there's this sense, because of what the Chinese have been doing with the stuff of all these East Asia societies, that, oh, that is what that stuff was for. Yeah. And it's completely reframed it. Or yeah. the, other, the big political one is obviously this massive trend over the last few years of this disconcerting political shocks to do basically with deglobalization. You know, this kind of uh, this a, a, attack on the neoliberal consensus kept coming. I mean, obviously, lo lots of people on the left were doing it, but the, on the right, it was winning elections in a way that was just shocking people. And again, it's like this deglobalization wave now seems like strangely some kind of anticipatory or prophetic process that was just naturally consummates itself in this, uh, in the coronavirus uh, calamity, you know, and seems like, so of course, decoupling with China, of course, uh, everyone's locked down in place, of course, people are flying, all of that stuff is suddenly like within the, the, the viral framework, completely intelligible in a way it was just weird for people before. But it's it's kind of both though, isn't it? Like Vince, Vince, you wrote about this recently. Like at the same time, mm. there seems to be a consolidation of of a kind of like in, like a global empire as well as this fragmentation. Um, yeah, I mean it, it, it's it's a kind of pincer process again, right? So you have the <laughs> you have the fragmentation and the integration at the same time. But what's what's clear is that what's in the middle, which is our present political order, it, it can't stand. Yeah. Yeah. But sort of which way is it is the tendency, the tendency. going to resolve? Uh, like, are we heading towards consolidation or fragmentation? I don't. I don't think it has to resolve. I think both processes can go on at the same time. Like in terms of temporality, it's kind of like there is this sort of like um, to kind of borrow the language that, that like from that Anna has used a long time ago to talk about the, like time. Um, in terms of syntheses, there's this kind of like tempo, which is the sort of global synchronic subject. Uh, and then against that, there are all these kind of erratic rhythms of different nations and different states inside nations, closing down their borders, imposing different rhythms of measures, um, and then kind of appearing at different points on this spatialized curve that Robin's been talking about. Uh, so there's this kind of like strange sort of like percussive thing happening with this um, tension between the the tempo and the but, rhythm, but but then all of it is is somehow knitted together, because this deglobalization wave didn't succeed until mm. the virus came. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Manufacturing was not being rehomed quickly enough, um, and a lot of global supply chains were obviously still fragile, as we can now see. Um, and we now have the spectacle of different countries having to cringe before China in order to get their medical equipment, their protective equipment, um, because they don't have the manufacturing capability to do it, to do it themselves, despite this decade of deglobalization. So all of it is still catastrophically interdependent. Yeah. Do we have our caller? Is that me? Yeah, hi. I've no idea what your name is because your Skype name is like uh, just a random string of characters. Oh, that's really this? weird. My name's Nat. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks for calling in. Yeah, of course. I, I love the podcast. I love having something to listen to where people are uh, talking at a little bit more of a higher level about what exactly the fuck is going on. Are we doing that? <laughs> are we doing that? I'm not sure. Uh, it's entertaining no. for me, at least. We're, the level's high enough for me, anyway. Yeah. How Sorry. are you? How are you coping with the uh, temporal uh, scrambling? Oh man, it's it's a scramble for sure. Um, not a whole lot has changed as far as my routine, other than um, I'm wearing less clothes on a daily basis. I'm working no from pants. home. No hard pants. No hard pants whatsoever. Where are you in the world? In the U.S. Uh, I'm in Michigan. Kind right. of in northern Michigan a bit, so less populated around here, but still still impacted for sure. So what are you saying? 
You've called in. Tell us something. Oh dear God. Um, well, I um, <laughs> I think it's really interesting watching watching this this coronavirus take hold in the Western nation nations. I mean, we're watching like um, countries grapple with trying to trying to do what it is that humanity wants to do, right? Sustain economic viability while um, an outside naturalistic force is, is kind of forcing us to react in, in a way that doesn't align with those values inherently. I mean, we're looking at human life versus money on a large scale, so I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, one interesting thing is uh, just the kind of sheer weirdness of the fact that so many things can shut down you know, which seemed unimaginable before, that the fact that all of these things can just shut down at once. And yeah, sure, we're talking about how strange it is and we're talking about the economic effects, but it's not like reality is crumbling before our eyes. And that in itself is kind of an interesting phenomenon that, um, you know, it kind of uh, proves that all of these things can just kind of stop and reality still uh resists yeah well a lot of things seem a a little made up at at this point i mean i was always told so far that i could never i could never work from home for example yeah 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 we were talking about this um on an earlier one weren't we where um you know it's saying it's a bit like uh after the war when women had all gone to work been called up to work in the factories and then you know that you can't go back on that and i wonder whether there's going to be an effect after Mm -hmm. this that people are going to say you know i'm not going to sit on a train for two hours to go and sit at a desk you know because i, I hope so yeah but <laughs> have so you've you've actually changed from what well, commuting going to an office to working at home now yeah yeah, yeah. and most of my office has too um i think p- part of uh my workspace is that you know people have to commute at least some of them because they don't have like very good internet in more rural areas um but I'm not one of those people, so it's very easy for me to just stay home and and do the same work as always and, and you're have the same that meetings. As a, as a po- you're experiencing that as a positive thing overall. I I absolutely think so. Yeah, I mean, coming home and I mean, not even coming home, right? But you know, 5 p.m. strikes and I'm I'm not tired. I I have time and energy to do. Yeah, right. I mean, there's a there's a temporal aspect to this as well. Um, uh, I'll I'll speak as someone who's hasn't had a proper job for. Uh, long long time is that uh, yes your time if you're working at home is more flexible but that also has a downside that um, uh, your work can creep into every hour of the day and uh, or that you can go the other way that you can just put something off forever because you've got so many other things you could be doing because you're inside your own house yeah but, uh, well, it does it's I- kind of has an interesting effect do you think on uh, identity as well that your identity you know, when you uh, work somewhere different to where you live, you have this kind of um, this uh, portal that you go through and your identity switches a bit. Whereas if you're at home working, then you're just the same person all the time. I think that can be a bit wearing. So it, it may be that um, some people are kind of glad to go back and to have that, at least the relief of having this other person that you become every day when you walk out the door. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think um, working from home has kind of forced me to consider the integration of my work into my like everyday regular identity as a person. I mean, staying at home and, and living my regular life, I've I've even become more open to working on weekends because I'm like, well, I'm here. My computer's here. I could I could get some work done. Why right. not? Well, this is another interestingly then that makes it seem like this is another sense in which uh, the crisis is accelerating tendencies that already existed in if you like post-industrial post-modern capitalism like this thing of everyone becoming the entrepreneur of themselves uh, and that your your work and your life are completely integrated so you know maybe it's another way in which the the virus situation is accelerating everything i think so i I've, i know a lot of people that are starting to stream on twitch for yeah, <laughs> out right. of hopes of getting an income right now yeah, I mean, I'm I'm doing this. I've earned some coffees. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to buy you a coffee after this. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Every, is everyone still there? Yeah. 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 No, I think this point is is important, right? That I, this is a very common 
uh, sentiment that it's it, everyone feels like they have more time, like we, we were sp speaking of. And, and I think there's this, this big question about to what extent, like, to me, this is one of the biggest questions about the future, like in, well, I don't know how far we're going to put it, uh, when time restarts, right, a year from now or whatever it is, six months from now. Um, is it just that we look back on this and 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 it seems that things have accelerated to a certain degree, but you know that I sort of that was weird and it becomes this kind of dreamlike yeah. weird space, or is it that there's these fundamental transitions that that we can only understand in the post COVID world, you know? Um, so I think that's very unclear, right? Like there's all these ways in which it seems as if things that were happening are only being accelerated by it. But there's another sense where you think, well, the whole world, this is the whole world has transformed and will never be the same. And and that yeah. future is unknown. I'm right? actually surprised that I'm not seeing, perhaps I'm just kind of sheltered from their discourse, which would be a, a mercy, but I'm, Surprised that I'm not seeing more kind of uh, uh, leftist, uh, st like uh, communist stuff about. Look, this is how the world could be. Let's kind of try to st structure things so that we can't go back. Because there is that, this sense in which, like, the basic income, like the universe, the the universe yeah, sure. basic income, is obviously one of those discourses that has been massively accelerated. Right. I think Jay who has done that, hasn't he? Robin, like, just said. Uh, yeah, into yeah. an argument, I bad you saying, right. what the hell, quite, quite colourful language, you know, what the hell are you thinking, like, everyone's being thrown out of work and you think that's a problem, I think yeah. it's pretty funny he's, he's saying. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there is a certain tendency now, I think, like, you at the beginning, there is this uh, fear, horror, kind of disorientation. And bit by bit, I'm certainly feeling more and I'm seeing more people thinking, uh, you know, how are we going to feel if all of this is over and then we go back to exactly how things were before? Or in terrible. fact, worse, because because the economy is going to be in, in terrible shape. Yeah. And obviously this is a very big question for China, right? Yeah. Uh, and I and I think, I mean, I'm interested in what Vince has, thinks about this, but uh, it would seem that this decoupling and and sort of bringing manufacturing home and China as the factory to the world is going to get hit very very badly, right? Or um, I, so I understood that um, the kind of the advantage China's China was drawing an advantage from having been the first in that it would be the first then to be able to restructure and build up the industries and to be in a position to serve the economies that were still going to be in a mess like six months down the line is that right. not the case well I think that there's an interesting I mean it's obviously this AI tech model that uh, that this sensing what you know this sensing or uh, and, and testing and um, that allows for the society to reopen. And the, and the question about whether, uh, I mean, I just read today, but I didn't read, I don't know if anyone knows more about it, that Google and AI and Apple have uh, joint forces to perhaps like just copy, I don't know, copy what Tencent and Alibaba have been doing. Right. Uh, you know, for, for the last six, six weeks or something like that. So, um, the sort of that tech component and the AI component is obviously really important to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know to, to what extent it's, act, it's going to be that big of a shock to China compared to the shock that's in store or already unfolding in the West, certainly in yeah. Europe and, I mean, also in America. China, for one thing, in terms of the exports, it's, it's no longer the economy that it was mm -hmm. uh, 20 or even 10 years ago. It's no longer as export dependent. And the Chinese government has, has kind of known that this moment was coming for a long time. Um, 
And so you do see this new focus on on trying to move into high tech and so on. There was a fascinating point made by a, a dissident economist called Branko Milanovic recently, who, who pointed out that China is roughly at the threshold where further Chinese growth will increase rather than decrease global inequality, which is um, it's a, it's an interesting point. I mean, but it basically, it means that China, China is a different sort of economy now. Mm -hmm. um, and the sorts of kind of ground level aspects of economic catastrophe that have materialized in the US have not really materialized in China. You're not seeing huge numbers of business bankruptcies. Um, retail in China hasn't been hit as badly as it has in the US and in Europe. In fact, the sectors of the Chinese economy that have been hit worst are, are the ones in which the Chinese government is most deeply involved. And so it can control things at a quite fine level of detail. I don't I mean, know what the, the that, long that range. Maybe is that, that we're maybe, I, I'm not sure that that's, it will be interesting to see whether that sort of low end uh, entrepreneurial sort of noodle stand type level of the economic economy is resilient enough um yeah I mean, it looks like it is now it, it sort of depends on whether there's a second wave or whether it has to close down again and and you know that sort of unknown yes um i mean if, if the lockdown had lasted for another couple of weeks or another month then yeah. there would be huge bankruptcies in, in china the problem with the us and europe of course is that they they imposed their lockdown a little too late um, compared to the the eventual speed of the Chinese response. And what we found is that the countries that are late also end up having the biggest economic consequences. I mean, how complete are the Western lockdowns now? Like, is London and New York still running metros, trade services, and um, some kind of skeleton of public transport? I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. know whether it has even got to the absolute extremes that China reached when it, especially obviously in Kobe. Yeah. It, def it definitely hasn't in the UK. I mean, this general lockdown basically doesn't exist in the UK at the moment. Right. I think New York is still running public transit to some extent as well. Yeah. So they're burying people in the park, but they're still... Uh, <laughs> Yep. Shoving yeah, them on trains like sardines. Yeah, right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a, to be honest, it's a joke in the UK. It's just, yeah, there's no real. Well, you know, as soon as you get a tiny bit of rigor about it, like you get a policeman telling someone off, then everyone's complaining about it and it's on the news. And there's a kind of outcry about it. So. But the, the, the police here, I mean, there's just a sort of kind of clownish yeah. element. To it, you see like police vans going past with loudspeakers telling people not to sunbathe. Like, um, it just looks ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I saw the most German thing I've ever seen where at the market they had uh, traffic cops with a giant ruler making sure everyone was <laughs> distancing <laughs> properly. And just yes. seeing like a German cop with a giant ruler was just too much for me, I think. That reminds me to give a shout out to the, the guy who wrote the article about um, surreptitiously going to the farmer's market in New York while listening to Plague Pod. Thanks for the, <laughs> thanks for the mention, guy. <laughs> and also, we shouldn't forget the uh, very important public safety messages that the British government is putting out. Act like you got it, baby. You're so hot, you're giving me a fever.
anything. Come. And stay wherever you are because we have guns and we have tanks. Anything that's bad, come! Organs crawl like aphids upon the immobile motor of becoming sucking at intensive fluids that convert them cybernetically into components of an unconceivable machinism. The sap is becoming stranger, and even if the fat bugs of psychiatrically policed property relations think they make everything happen, they are following a program which only schizophrenia can decode. Anorganic becomings happen retro-efficiently, anastrophically, they are tropisms attesting to an infection by the future. Convergent waves zero upon the body, subverting the totality of the organism by way of an inverted but ateleological causality, enveloping and redirecting progressive development. As capital collides schizophrenically with the matrix, ascendant sedimentations of organic inheritance and exchange are melted by the descendant intensities of virtual corporealization. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Machinic processing or its reprocessing by the body without organs? The body without organs is the cosmic egg. Virtual matter that reprograms time and reprocesses progressive influence. What time will always have been is not yet designed and the future leaks into schizophrenia. The schizo only has an etiology as a sub-program of descendant reprocessing. How could medicine be expected to cope with disorderings that come from the future? It is thus that the great secret of Indian culture is to restore the world to zero. Always. But sooner. One, too late than sooner. Two, which is to say, sooner than too soon. Three, which is to say that the later is unable to return unless sooner has eaten too soon. Four, which is to say that in time, the later is what precedes both the too soon and the sooner. Five, and that however precipitate the sooner, the too late, which says nothing, is always there, which, point by point, unstacks all the sooner. A cyber-negative circuit is a loop in time, where a cyber-positive circuitry loops time itself, integrating the actual and the virtual in a semi-closed collapse upon the future. Descendant influence is a consequence of ascendantly emerging sophistication, a massive speed-up into an apocalyptic phase change. The circuits get hotter and denser as economics, scientific methodology, neo-evolutionary theory and AI come together. Terrestrial matter programming its own intelligence at impact upon the body without organs equals zero. Futural infiltration is subtilizing itself as capital opens onto schizotechnics, with time accelerating into the cybernetic backwash from its flip-over, a racing non-linear countdown to planetary switch. Schizoanalysis was only possible because we are hurtling into the first globally integrated insanity. Politics is obsolete. Capitalism and schizophrenia hacked into a future that programs it down to its punctuation, connecting with the imminent inevitability of viral revolution, soft fusion. No longer infections threatening the integrity of organisms, but immunopolitical relics obstructing the integration 
of global viral control. Life is being phased out into something new, and if we think this can be stopped, we are even more stupid than we seem. How would it feel to be smuggled back out of the future in order to subvert its antecedent conditions? To be a cyber gorilla, hidden in human camouflage so advanced that even one's software was part of the disguise? Exactly like this.
You're listening to Urbanomic Plague Pod. Um, we're talking about COVID, time, patchwork, the global synchronization. Is everyone still here? Maybe we can come back to this yeah. um, this patchwork versus um, global synchronization question because there certainly seems to be potential for the acceleration of fragmentation um, in this crisis. If only because of this um, kind of existing temporal fragmentation that's already already taken place and the differing responses of differing um, governments. Um, how do you see that, Nick? Well, one of the things we were talking about sort of in preparation actually for this discussion um, was in terms of deglobalization, and especially Sino-American decoupling, the decoupling that should be added to that, and which is most relevant to the question you're now asking, is, is urban or, or metropolis hinterland decoupling. Because, you know, the big cities, I mean, I did very much include Shanghai, London and New York, obviously, um, are not going to become uh, post-cosmopolitan. I mean, they're, they're essentially they're essentially destined to be cosmopolitan centers. Um, so in the epoch that we're in now, where that means that they're kind of highly viropositive and, and, and function as menaces to their own sort of societies, there's a lot of sort of uh, impetus towards uh, social distancing between between cities and, the, and their hinterlands. I mean, there's no people living out in the sticks do not want to have to introduce a regime of extreme uh, biological surveillance in order to just run their normal lives. It's completely unnecessary. Um, whereas people in, in the big cities probably are going to be forced to make this choice, I mean, I'm absolutely 100% confident which way they'll come down on it, that they will accept previously unimagined levels of minute surveillance in order to be able to remain open cosmopolitan centers. And so the, the conclusion that we were drawing from that is that, is that probably as units of political organization, cities are going to see a, a, a kind of jolt an upward jolt in their importance. And I mean, that's what, where does that leave the, where does that leave the denizens of the rural? rural <laughs> place? Is this, does it kind of become a peasantry again? Well, it's, it's interesting. You can do it either way, can't you? I mean, one of the stories that was that struck people a lot uh, in America was when Rhode Island started stopping cars with New York license plates and and turning them around, you know, and everyone's seen the example Anna really likes is everyone's seen those pictures of the kind of villages in China with guys with medieval weapons standing on the road, you know, so it's not that the hinterland is just simply being like uh, pushed out or, or excluded, it's rather that it is, is actively uh, arming itself, protecting itself against the metropolis, which becomes a kind of, the metropolis becomes a kind of social menace, a, a national danger zone. Um, but the, the, um, the extra urban zones are also kind of batteries for the cities, right? I mean, the, the intensity uh, and the concentration of a city can't be maintained without drawing on, you know, food, resources, yeah, sure. Uh, grown in these outlying places, so there's presumably a kind of power dynamic there as well. Um, it, well, it's interesting what that power dynamic is. Again, it's like uh, largely to do with the fact that you know articulate elites tend to be urban, so you, you everything gets seen from their point of view. The media is run from that point of view, but I mean, it seems to me very possible that. 
that the, the hinterland could just decide that it wants to get off the bus or at least, you know, not be on a bus ride quite as exciting as the bus ride that the cities are taking people on. Um, and so there's some room for people to sort it on that, uh, on that basis. There's an interesting twist with the medieval weapons because I asked I asked quite a few uh, Chinese friends what was going on there, and the and the consensus seems to be that these are all theatre props. They're all props from Chinese <laughs> opera, right? Um, and Even it, it's this weird, like temporal twist. It reminds me of something that you said, Nick, in in your book Templexity, where you talk about the strategic inauthenticity of the different kind of types of time in Shanghai. It's the same sort of. Um, inauthentic return of the past. Right. Yeah. How about um, the California, Calexit? This is all, also seems to be um, being put quite seriously on the table. I mean, I, my problem with this sort of stuff is I just get overexcited about it and run too far ahead. I mean, you know, I'd love to see something like Calexit happen, but frankly... You know, it's not going to happen anytime soon. It would be, it would be my, my tedious, sober judgment about it. So ultimately I mean, then, for the virus, uh, the, the whole um, crisis, do you think, do you see it as a generally an accelerative um, entity? Or do you think it's just too complex to come down on one side or the other? Well, probably the latter is the right answer, but the former answer is more attractive. So, I mean, I tend to think that overall and, and perhaps retrospectively, it will, it will have seemed much more of an accelerator than, than the accelerator. So, so we'll come out the other side of it uh, in a certain sense, kind of feeling like we're going back to normal and then we'll look back after a while and think, hey, this is not quite uh, how things were before. Well, I think also there's more optic shifting happening. Like, one uh, reference that seems to me like huge in all of this is Michel Foucault, who, you know, now when you look at it, lots of stuff that maybe looked vaguely metaphorical, yeah. just for the literal, realistic social analysis. And it's basically all his work is just saying, you know, it's all about contagion suppression. You know, everything, the whole social apparatus, power, knowledge, the way all these institutional structures work, it's, it's controlling contagions. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that this is the way people are going to see things. Like, the, it just changes what people think government is about or what it's related, the whole way of articulating the kind of left-right spectrum in terms of, 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 of socialised or privatised, liberalised economy, I think is somehow, you, you know, uh, viral positivity about, about contagion. And, and so the, the, the biopower apparatus, if it's kind of not pathologically... Uh, if it's not a kind of an autoimmune reaction, like a, a cytokine storm, I think they call it. If it's not like that, then it has to accept um, that, yeah, commerce is good, it requires commerce, so its resources come from commerce, commerce is efficient, but commerce is contagion. And so the actual orientation of the social structure is fundamentally anti-commercial, but with... Uh, an option, a sort of sliding scale of about, you know, what level of emergency we're in right now. And if we're in a low level of, of pandemic threat, then we can dial it right back and let commerce happen. But always that control knob is there. And that's, I think that's what people were not seeing. That's like when Vince was saying everyone was completely shocked by what China did. It's like Western scientists have forgotten they even had that control on. Mm -hmm. They'd forgotten what sort of machine these political systems were, these administrative systems. They'd forgotten what kind of control apparatus was available to them and what it was for and when it would be used. And, and so people saw China do this and they thought, oh my God, what is that? You know, we, we can't even think of doing that. And then a month later, everyone's doing that uh, because that's what these systems are for. 
and they'd just forgotten it. Someone yeah. in the uh, chat here is saying, um, Nick, what would you say to the idea that um, the virus is actually a product of that concentrated, uh, dense urban society and the pandemic is a kind of uh, uh, an oppositional force to that type of um, human uh, settlement, I guess? You know, isn't, isn't the virus, pro uh, in, in fact, produced by the... Um, global metropolitan um, lifestyle we're well, not produced but um, yeah, that's what allows it to to emerge yeah that's totally right I mean I was looking recently at um, what's his name Scott sorry I've forgotten his James Scott. James Scott yeah James Scott's book I don't know whether you know against the grain it's this like long history of urbanism and the state and he too is it's obsessed with contagion. And his basic story is that people totally overestimate the degree to which the state urban form has has, has been uh, robust and implacably on the rise. He said for almost all of history it was extremely fragile because it would keep getting destroyed by epidemics. Um, and you know, it was it was in this kind of arms race with epidemics and not at all in a position of of any kind of security in that respect until extremely recently in in history um so i definitely think that's right i think i think the virus is tending to obliterate uh cosmopolitan liberalism you know that's what it that's its um that's its fundamental orientation um but is this because the virus is like aligned with cosmopolitan liberalism? Like it is a sort of avatar of how that structurally how that works. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yes, it's, it's, the same it's, it's a model. Yeah. It's a model for it. Yes, or a kind yeah. of the other round. Yeah. So it's kind of usurped the like the sort of mantle of cosmopolitan liberalism from human from human yeah, the, the, cosmopolitan liberals. The reaction it induces necessarily. I think it probably put it badly. I think it's definitely that the reaction induced by the virus is yeah. directly oriented towards the suppression of, of cosmopolitan mm -hmm. liberalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry. I was just to comment on that, I think, I mean, like as someone with, who has friends in rural Michigan as well as metropolitan Detroit area, Michigan, I think people in the metropolitan areas are, are deeply concerned, whereas the people in the rural areas are, are more concerned with getting back to work as soon as possible. They don't really take this very seriously and they're, and they're kind of upset by the reaction because it, it applies more to a, a metropolitan area than it would to the rest of the rural state. Yeah, that, that's totally right. Can I just add this other thing that's maybe like a half thought about planning? Um, because obviously uh, I think one of the strange temporal elements of this is that it's impossible to plan, like just, per, you know, personally, it's impossible to plan. But also that China's, um, you know, the planned economy and how we saw planning as coming very early on in the outbreak, that uh, these QR codes and this kind of machine for, uh, like what Nick's saying, this kind of machine for control during an outbreak just got activated really quite quickly. Um, and so this, I, you know, it's just this question about uh, planning and the capacity to operate within the pandemic. And then on the side of looking at it from uh, Canada or North America, or I, I suppose Europe as well, where there really just seems to be no planning um, and, and just, it just strikes me that that planning is another temporal dimension in which this is operating. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, time for, to break for some music. I think we've got um, Bogner coming in to uh, talk as well. Hopefully, if we're, if we're trying to get her on the line.
Dust off crew out to the LA posse out to Blaze. the track list crew uh, track ID track ID buy me a coffee first in the chat he can tell you he knows what's up this one's Daniel Bell the great Daniel Bell flying saucer Nakonio with us. Yep. 
はいはいはい、ボグナ、そう、You had an interesting hypothesis to put to us, I believe. Yes, hi, good morning from Hong Kong, where I'm asleep. Thanks for joining I am, us. You are.、Um, <laughs> yeah, I had some thoughts、um, regarding what Anna、um, talked about with planning and also virus time. So, like, first of all, the question of virus modeling, as it is with climate modeling. Kind of gives us a type of knowledge in which we can only access the real via simulation. So, simulation becomes the dominant mode of knowledge. And empirical data plays a role, but adequately simulating planetary conditions which is more important. So, what kind of planning can we do? What kind of a real it is when it is mostly simulated? And that's the question of both cyber culture and COVID culture. So, I think that's quite an interesting intersection. And then I have been reading Anna's re recent interview in Shroom Journal, shout out to Shroom Journal, where she talks about the time spiral in relation to technological innovation. So, like the time spiral as the repetition of the future through the invocation of the past. And I was thinking maybe viruses have their own version of that. Like in the Medea hypothesis of Peter Ward, who's a paleobiologist, I think, and he argues that life on Earth is essentially suicidal. So, microbial threat triggered mass extinctions are attempts to return the Earth to the microbial state it has been in for many years of its history. So, microbes are like ultimate reactionaries and they think for self replication. And maybe viral life happens in cycles of regression and progression, just like human politics. And viruses have their own like time spiral. Yeah, I don't have anything more. Like, I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I obviously like, want Anna to like, comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Anna. <laughs>、um, obviously, there's been just tons of talk about, and this is also a time issue, right? That this is somehow a foreshadow or something for climate crisis, whatever that means. But I think obviously, part of what it means is what you're saying about these sort of simulated futures and, and modeling. Um, uh, I, we were talking about this earlier this question about the virus finding, like, adapting to its own environment, which is in the human host, right? So, that again is this other question that makes the future very unknown. So, I, I think that the theory that, or one theory is that the Because it's a new virus for humans, it's, it's so、uh, you know, difficult for us. But that as it acclimatizes to the human host,、uh, we human organisms and, and COVID virus get along a lot better.、Um, but obviously, there's the counter examples,、um, you know, which is like the, like the Spanish flu, where the second wave. Was more deadly than the, the first wave. So I think that that's, you know, this is still an empirical question that still、uh, we, we don't know. I mean, beyond, beyond the epidemiological aspect, like the, the emergence of a second wave would be catastrophic economically because it means that no one will be able to tell whether it's safe to actually resume normal activities.、Um, It's one thing when you've got a quarantine which begins and then ends, but then when you've got the prospect of endless future quarantines, it's going to be a lot more difficult to get the economy rolling again. But isn't that what this planning question is about? Like, we are in. Yeah, yeah.、Uh, I mean, I think most people assume there will be a second wave or a, a, and a third, you know, in, unless, you know, the future is different or whatever. I don't know if the markets assume that. Uh huh. The markets are doing their own thing, but、yeah. <laughs> so、certainly the way the stock market has behaved recently is, is not seen to me to be pricing it in. <laughs> Then, do we, do, we, do we do jump kind of straight in into shifting epistemology completely to the simulated kind of knowledge? Because it seems a way to understand 
you know, how markets work, how the virus works, how climate works. And, you know, we still in our like funny biological human bodies are stuck in this empirical perceptual present and we're trying to grasp this virtual um, economy virus climate. So how can we cognitively even achieve that is a problem, I think, mm -hmm. for, for epistemology at least. I mean, some yeah, people said this is a very humbling moment for model builders, you know, and like yeah, we, yeah. because of the whole global anthropogenic warming thing, I mean, everyone's been living where this whole question about models and what they're projecting or whatever has been very central to a lot of very heated political debates. But the, but the speed at which that's been happening has not been such that it can really test the models in a convincing way within a time frame that people can grasp easily. Whereas with this, we're seeing the models go up and and um, the, the epidemic line go off course as far as the model is concerned within days or, and weeks. And I mean, you know, I think there's a question of whether people are going to come out of this saying that maybe we should just be a little bit warier about modeling and, and 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 withdraw some of the faith that we've put in it because when it was actually you know put to the test it really wasn't very impressive and served only as the vaguest kind of guideline uh, about what was happening right like not to bring this down to a kind of like petty philosophical scuffle but i think one of the things that's been really um eviscerated by the events that we're going through with some of the like basic premises of um, neo-rationalism. Like the whole focus on modeling epistemology as the fundamental way of grasping reality is just being completely exploded apart by the emergence but, of this exogenous what event. What else have we got? What's the alternative? I mean, epistemology mm -hmm. is modeling, isn't it? So we're like, what's the alternative? It's not as if we have some other better way that we should now switch to. It's there not, isn't an alternative. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's basically uh, trauma, isn't it? We're discovering that the <laughs> but the biosphere is not a stable or safe place for, for us to be. Right, just, but it never has been. Sorry, Bogdan. Sorry, yeah. It's just a foreclosed kind of knowledge. And I think faith in modeling, I don't know how much faith there is. Definitely there's, you know, knowledge of general veracity of climate models. But then when you read climate modeling papers, the scientists themselves, you know, they've been writing these papers, oh, can we make the models simpler so different scientists from different disciplines can um, adequately understand them? You know, scientists themselves are comparing themselves kind of to Borgesian cartography, it's supposed to be modeling. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's also, like the faith is not, is much more in the popular political discourse. When you get to scientific papers, there's much debate about you know, how to adequately model clouds and like how to parameterize and so on. So there's a lot of debate about the actual course of climate change as much as the general veracity of human. But it's always kind of a partial knowledge. But we also have to remember, like um, in the famous title of Mackenzie's book, that um, models, a model's an engine, not a camera, that the existence, the presence of these models is itself introducing perturbations into all the systems that we're modeling continuously. Yeah. Yeah. As, as I was going to say, I think it's, it's very hard to separate the success of any of these models from the game of chicken that everyone's playing b between the virus and the economy. Because if all the, all the models are ultimately only taking in uncertainty to the effect that they're making the economy keep running then the way they're parametrizing, parametrizing ugh, is, you know, going to be with a huge skew towards affordability. So, you know, I feel like if you have, whereas if you have like a bio, if you have a biopolitics like China is doing and not just like biopolitical theater that the West has been doing because they didn't want to spend the money to do it. You know, I think if you actually did real biopolitics, you'd have maybe actual models that were less about um, just keeping the economy from totally exploding 
and more about actually trying to understand the flows of of contagion. But I, I do find it very interesting. I mentioned it earlier. Um, obviously, I personally have no clue what's going on in the secret committees in China that are determining this, but it seems like they're not relying on modeling per se mm -hmm. to yeah. the same degree that the West is. Yeah. They're basically yeah. making pure political decisions. Um, the first was obviously the mass quarantine, but also stuff like closing the borders um, and then also this this interplay between the local and the um, central governments in China, where you have local governments imposing new lockdown measures and then occasionally the central government will countermand it. And that sort of stuff is all happening basically out of purely political motives. And it's not it's not founded in this kind of obsession with with modeling numbers, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. But I mean, that's true in lots of other countries. I mean, especially anywhere that has like a federalist structure, it's going to be a huge battle between local and and central. Like in, in Germany, for instance, you know, Merkel said, don't uh, celebrate Easter. And then the local authorities said, no, it's fine. <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely. You see it in the US as well. But I guess I guess my yeah. point is that you know, models as such are not being mobilized into this debate in China um, in the way that they are, for example, in the UK, where you have these competing models that I mentioned, and they are mm -hmm. very publicly being instrumentalized by factions within the government that align with particular responses to the virus. Right. And the models are going to look a lot like the availability of testing as well in those locations because i think i mean in the u.s at least we don't have that availability so we're not seeing an accurate model i mean so yeah, what so are we working off of at that point it's obviously like that this is just a pure time question right like that the time it takes to test and the time it takes to read those tests and so the data you know, I mean, the, the the fastest that I've heard of a test result is five hours, which is in Shanghai. So this question about modeling and the time of the empirical, um, you know, this is part of also the planning thing, right? Like the, the idea is that when we get this like no time lag testing, then we'll understand what's happening, right? right. Um, yeah, and, and the exponential curve is overwhelming the testing curve in this sense. It seems like the, the, the sort of the numbers get more and more meaningless as the as the virus spreads because less and less of it is being detected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also with modeling, it's not only the time, it's also that with climate models, for example, because we have no control Earth on which we can do experiments and measure things, basically scientists have to simulate a wholly artificial Earth and simulate all the physical processes and then kind of they let the artificial world like spin up and after it reaches equilibrium then they simulate the climate but it's like this artificial world for testing a uh, hypothesis which i don't know how possible is that to do with the virus or what that would achieve mm -hmm. and then also with the relationship to the economy i had just a strange impression watching the american government trying to appease the market in the beginning that they were almost like priests in this weird ritual, like trying to say something just to stabilize the market. So at first they were saying, oh, we're not gonna do anything, like let the old people die and the market dropped. So then they came to the stage again and were like, we're gonna do everything we can. And then the market started going up and then they were like lockdown for a month and then it started going down. So they tried two weeks and then it started going up again. So it's like trying to appease this like ancient god like, like what do you need to say exactly cool right well it's coming up to 4 a.m here so <laughs> i think i'm gonna um Oof. cut this thing but does anybody want to have a final last word on uh the templexical effects of uh, covid19 i i have a question for nick if that's okay, okay. yeah Ed. Yeah, Nick, I'm just wondering, um, I mean, during the coronavirus, we're, we're seeing a lot of people talk about um, maybe mandatory vaccinations and, um, you know, ID 2020, which is more or less a conspiracy nut case, right? But um, I'm curious what you have to say about, like, the use of blockchain and those types of things and what that will do to, like, the future of humanity. Given, given maybe like a post 9-11 situation with this coronavirus? Um, well, honestly, I, could, I just haven't put in the work yet. I mean, I think 
you know, to integrate all of this, what's going on right now, into into thinking about blockchains, and it is obviously fascinating. And you know, like there's been a lot of talk. Uh, I think it's um, Bill Gates' plan or whatever to have an immunity pass. Right. Um, yeah. You know, these systems where you've got some kind of um, certification for your sort of pathologic status, of course, you know, is that is is very uh, sort of similar to the kind of uh, credential issues that blockchains are, are supposedly uh, have a lot of promise in. Um, so I, I mean, I'm just sort of emptily recognizing the significance of the question, and it's really good, and, but I don't honestly think I can say anything about it that isn't inane, you know. Uh, yeah, that's that's totally fair. I, I hope I can talk to you again about it at some right, point. Sure, yeah, that would be good. Well, I hope, um, you know, I hope that um, some of you will come back again, and um, it's been great to have you. Thanks very much for joining us, and um, yeah, that's, it was great to talk to you. Cheers. Okay, thanks for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to play out with. Uh, I've got a few, few more tracks Jungle to play. Jungle is massive. <laughs> this is uh, an amazing track from the album by uh, Mohammed Reza Mortazavi. I was going to play this for my friend Negrastani if he's listening. Um, and thanks very much to um, Mark, Mark Fell, going out to Mark because he recommended this this one to me. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. This one is called um, Taken by the Wind. And uh, then I've got a few more tunes for you, and then we'll say goodbye. Uh, I'll be back next week with Tom, hopefully, and with a pretty amazing audience special with some exclusive uh, stuff from Code 9 from the audience crew and some readings from the book. Thanks for joining us on the Plague Pod again, and I'll see you next time. Because 
I wouldn't wanna get dropped myself. They told me that they had my back till I clocked I got myself. Back then when I never had no bread is when I was not myself. I was thinking about taking this nigga's life. Then I had to stop myself. Because I wouldn't wanna get dropped myself. They told me that they had my back till I clocked I got myself. Back then when I never had no bread is when this I was the novelist with Shailan. This is off the EP Heat, recorded in a car. Come loud, but I'm not on stealth. I'm always rolling up some loud. Mom says, what's your health? All I know is putting in work. I ain't got time to chill. I'm trying to perform at rolling loud, but the feds want me jail. I've been raised in this, ain't trying to be where it's hot as hell. Big friends want to see me down and out. I know they hope I fell. Sometimes I want to catch a body, but I control myself. I'm trying to do it for my fans, so like a show as well. Remember being locked up behind them doors. I used to stress myself mm. Yeah, it was just me and I Can't forget myself just me, Use just my me. eyes, put it back on the shelf No, I don't need no skills no I've been trying to find my way I can't be sitting still no Straight to the top, fall off and drop I know they wish I will okay. I was thinking about taking a nigga's life But I stopped myself Because I ain't trying to get locked Or drop myself I was thinking about taking this nigga's life Then I had to stop myself Because I wouldn't want to get dropped myself. They told me that they had my back till I clocked I got myself. Back then when I never had no bread is when I was not myself. I was thinking about taking this nigga's life. Then I had to stop myself. Because I wouldn't want to get dropped myself. They told me that they had my back till I clocked I got myself. Back then when I never had no bread is when I was not myself. Can't give my heart to a jazz. Why would I mock myself? Don't take no pressure from anyone and I don't put it on myself. A lot of man talk hard, but I guess that they knock theirself. Been feeling like laying these rappers out, but I don't wanna block myself. When they killed my dog, it was peak and I don't know what I felt. When I got that news, I was hurt and feeling like I got shot myself. Finna cock this clock myself late night and I glided it off myself. But I don't wanna carry that guilt inside when I answer the God myself. But if I gotta answer the God myself, I'ma answer to God myself. Could have signed from time, but I wanna see mills, cause why would I rob myself? When I gave my heart to a yak like that, I ain't never forgot myself. Ain't putting my faith in another nigga when I could have done that job myself. When a two but can't. Put focus on a girl Bad B telling me that she's in love with me But she's not my girl I don't take no chance Because I don't put blame on myself I was feeling like putting in work in silence But I just stopped myself I was thinking about taking this nigga's life Then I had to stop myself Because I wouldn't want to get dropped myself They told me that they had my back Till I clocked I got myself Back then when I never had no bread Is when I was not myself I was thinking about taking this nigga's life Then I had to stop myself because I wouldn't wanna get dropped myself. They told me that they had my back till I clocked I got myself. Back then when I never had no bread is when I was not myself. The dead are not laid to rest once, return to the earth from whence they came. They are continually disinterred, cast and recast on the terminal beach, recursed at the behest of the endless recombination of the undivided waters, just as I, in the vault of murmurs, lost myself, was scattered, unborn, 
and undead. The rigorous analysis of all time anomalies excavates a spiral structure. Pneumogrammatic recoil toward the time assembler. One cannot look behind the curtain when one is not behind it. Yet, one may know, by means of certain exploits, that something lurks there, unbound. When the AOE, the architectonic order of the Eschaton, fortified the institutions, erecting those impassable obstacles to anomalous crossing, they couldn't help but drag something back in with them. But why was Templeton so determined to lever the wound open again, to spring the timeline? And why return here? Transcendental occurrence. Reopen the crypt. Too late. Too late. And yet... Mm -hmm. 